All right, well, thank you very much for inviting me along today. Um, it's a, an honor to be here, and uh, it's uh, amazing to see so many people. And so thank you very much for actually giving up your time to uh, come and hear what we have to say about plastic. So I, I guess when it comes to plastic, uh, particularly today, um, everybody is, is familiar with this material, um, a material which in 1950s was, was hardly uh, any in existence at all, and then has, has, has over time grown exponentially to just over 350 uh, million tons as the annual production last year. And, and, of course, you know, when we start to talk about plastic, there are all sorts of opinions about it now. You know, back in the 1950s, 1960s, it was, of course, the miracle material. Whereas now it's actually become a bit of a pariah because everybody is looking at things like plastic in the ocean and saying we have to do something about it. And we must. Because today, 40% of plastic actually ends up in landfills. 25% goes to incineration, or sometimes euph euphemistically called energy from waste. We'll come back to that later. Um, but then a shocking 19% does end up in the environment, creating scenes that look a bit like this. Now, this has become all too familiar at the moment, but this is a slide that I, I, I saw this picture in 2010, and uh, it's resonated with me. And so every um, uh, uh, lecture or every, every time I do a presentation in the company or outside of the company, I will always show this slide because it really goes to the core of, of, of why we do what we do. Now, where do those numbers come from? Um, w when I first started the company in, in 2011, and uh, we started talking to uh, uh, potential investors, we used to spend the entire time actually arguing about the fact whether there was a problem of plastic waste or not. Because most people's interaction with plastic was you put it in your wheelie bin and some nice chap comes and takes it away and surely it all gets recycled, right? Um, but you know, today, fortunately, we have people like McKinsey who have done an excellent job of trying to collate a lot of the numbers and try to make sense of the numbers and try to understand uh, what the uh, outcome for plastics actually is. And so you can see from this diagram that, uh, you, you know, this is uh, 2016, so only 330 million tons was produced in 2016. And you can see the outcomes that I was talking about uh, in the earlier slides. And so for those that were actually following the numbers, that obviously the 16% collected for recycling, of which only 12% is. Now, what do we mean by recycling? So um, up to this sort of point in time, Recycling of plastic typically means mechanical recycling, as you can see from the slide. Uh, and what that actually means is that people take things like uh, bottles, um, and see so if you think about a drinks bottle or your fizzy drink bottle, um, it's shredded, it goes through a color sorting, oh, it's washed, it goes through a color sorting um, um, uh, separation to make sure that you actually have plastics not only of the same polymer, um, but of the same color and then they are re-extruded to actually form pellets and to form products, so washed, color-sorted flake. That's the outcome of mechanical recycling. Now, of course, um, that has inherent issues. So each time you go through that process, you degrade the quality of the polymer. And so you can't make things of the same quality once you've actually gone through that process multiple times. Um, and so what typically happens is a bottle will actually become um, um, polyester, and, and, and if it's good quality, it might end up in clothing. If it's poor quality, it'll actually end up as carpets. Virtually never do you get a bottle going to a bottle. I mean, people talk about it, but the tonnages of that are very, very, very small indeed. Less than 2% of all plastic is actually bottle to bottle. Um, and then if you've got things like uh, HDPE, which you might identify with your drinks carton, then that will typically come back as a, uh, a wood replacement product. So think about park benches or fence panels or fence posts or you know, uh, uh, things that get used in the construction industry which offset lumbers. So you've either got fibers or lumbers. That's the main destination when we talk about recycling. But whichever way you look at it, it's insufficient. So the question is, what should we do? Now, when you look at a picture like this, then you, 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 know, you instinctively will respond, well, just get rid of it. We don't need that stuff. 
we didn't used to have that stuff in the past. We don't need straws. We can drink out of a cup. You know, we can have a glass. And I'm, I'm ever so pleased to see that we got glass uh, here today that, that you can wash it and you can reuse it. And, and of course, you know, that's uh, for this type of thing, absolutely the right thing to do is to push back on the unnecessary use of any resource when the utility that you get from that resource is dubious. When you look at a picture like this, and you think just about every fiber in there, every material in there, every surface in there is plastic. Now all of a sudden you, you, you begin to see the sense that actually there's a different utility to this. And it's single-use plastic, of course, but you know, I'm pretty sure there's not too many people would volunteer to have surgery with a, a surgeon that has had his gloves used a few times before. You know, and so we recognize that immediately there is sometimes a lot more utility in the use of the resource. And so what we have to look at is what value do we get from the resource? You know, we live on one planet. We have only so much resource available to us. And, and we have to be careful how we use any resource that we have been given to us in this planet. You look at a picture like this, and I'm not talking about the cans now, but I'm looking at the little collation piece that holds six cans together. And this kind of stuff drives you mad because you think, well, actually, we're perfectly capable of reaching back to the shelf and actually pulling another set of cans out. You know, the utility value of this is very, very low. And so I'm super pleased with everybody pushing back on plastic and saying, no, we want, don't want this stuff. Actually, maybe we should say we don't want as much of this stuff. And in the uses where the utility value is very, very low, then we should always question the use of any resource at all. Particularly when you see pictures like this and you see how this can actually become when it's in the environment. So no utility use, you've re used resource for no value, and you're creating a waste problem too. But what about this little chap? Well, big chap, probably. Um, and, and, and this picture here is to depict the rising temperatures in the world. And you have to start to think about plastic within a much, much bigger context. Because you can't think about one system without actually contemplating, what does this mean for carbon? You know, um, I, was, uh, I saw this uh, picture um, fairly recently, really. You know, people talk about carbon in the environment, and I was always a little bit unsure as to where it was actually at. And so this is the, the longest continuous monitoring of CO2 parts per million in the atmosphere that exists in the world, coming from Hawaii. And you start to see that, and you think, my goodness, since 1960, that's just going in one direction and one direction only. You can see the annual cycles. So when there's trees and there's leaves on the, on, on the trees, then it's absorbing carbon out of the atmosphere. And then in the winter, the carbon actually uh, hits a peak. But clearly, that's going up at a rate of knots. And then you sort of say, well, but does that matter? You know, the world, you know, has, a, is this all part of a, a big natural cycle? And then you look at this sort of graph, and it actually goes to the ice cores and tracks back 800,000 years. And when you realize that what we're talking about, we're up in the top right-hand corner here, and you recognize that actually now we are talking about things where we have taken the planet to a point where, well, the planet might have been there. I'm not too bothered about the existence of the planet, but I am bothered about the existence of humanity on the planet. So the carbon dioxide in the environment now is way beyond what it's ever been in the history of humanity. And so, you know, you do begin to wonder, you know, the sense of taking the planet on a journey, which actually we don't know what the destination of it is. And so when you think about, uh, you know, plastic, and we think about plastic in the environment, and we think about plastic going into the ocean, 12.2 million tons of plastic goes into the ocean each year. A horrendous number. You know, that's a truck a minute. This is, this is not litter. This is industrial scale dumping of plastic into the ocean. And, and uh, look, let me just pause there for a second, actually, sort of think, because, you know, people will actually sort of say, well, yes, but, you know, this is a Far East problem. And I've, I've been to conferences, and I've heard people uh, stand up, and they say, look, it's nothing to do with us. We don't do it in the UK. Let me just ask a question for a moment. We use 5 million tons of plastic in the UK. Well, how much capacity do we think we have in the UK for recycling plastic? Million tons? It's about 400,000 tons. 
And so we actually say that we recycle last year was 1.05 million tons of plastic we account for as being recycled in the UK last year. And so uh, how the difference? Well, actually, the balance, the 600 and odd thousand tons, we, we recycle by export. Um, and so where do we export it? Main destinations, Thailand, Singapore, um, uh, um, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Vietnam. I mean, you, you know, not the countries that, that actually you'd think are actually well set up for the receipt of such waste. And, and, and of course, we're not the only country that's doing this. The U.S. exports more plastic than anybody else um, and calls it recycled. Number two on the list is Japan. So Japan, where they, they really pride themselves in the amount of recycling, they're the number two exporter of plastic waste back into same type of countries. Germany, number three. So if you think that Germany is fantastic and Europe are doing great, I can tell you that they're not. And so in, uh, industrial scale movements of plastic who used to go to China, now going to places like Indonesia, and they frankly don't know what to do with it. They will pick through some of it and some plastic will get recycled. But the vast majority of it will be put onto landfills, and very often they are very completely uncontrolled landfills. They have rivers at the bottom, and, and clearly um, when it rains, it just gets washed out into the rivers and out into the ocean. So an awful lot of that 12.2 million tons of plastic that goes into the oceans each year is the same material that we have called recycled. And I would say shame on any civilized society that dumps its waste in countries that can ill afford or are ill equipped to actually deal with it. I think any civilized society should deal with its waste and deal with its waste at home. Thank you. But 12.2 million tons. But now then, we've talked about carbon in the environment. And the reason I've got the shard up there is to try and provide some sort of scale. Because if the 12.2 million tons is the height of the pavement outside the shard, the 33.1 gigatons of carbon going into the atmosphere each year from primary energy production uh, uh, on its own is the height of the shard. And so what we must absolutely not do is try to solve the, the problem of plastic in the ocean and thereby exacerbate the issue of carbon into the environment. Plastic in the ocean is awful. I've dedicated my life to try and actually solve that problem or to make a dent in that problem. But actually, even I will recognize that carbon in the environment is not so much an awful problem, but it could be a, potentially an existential threat to life itself, for humanity. And so what, what choices then do we have to make? And so, you know, it's very interesting, and I think even this morning was the guy from D.S. Smith was on talking about, you've got to go to paper. You know, paper is much more sustainable. Well, here's an interesting study. This came from the Scottish government when they actually looked at plastic bags. And they said, if everybody moved from plastic bags into paper bags, actually what you have to bear in mind is that the embedded carbon in paper is 3.3 times as much as what's in the plastic. And so when we start to think about, you know, we want to stop it going into the environment, well, the way of stopping it going into the environment is make sure you've got the capacity to recycle it. You know, at the moment, if you actually think of it, you take a bucket of water and, and you think about that as the plastic that we use, but the recycling is probably the size of your, you know, a tumbler of water. Now, if you try to get a bucket full into a tumbler, you're going to have spillage. And so if you've got much, much more material, vastly more material than you have capacity to recycle it, you're obviously going to get leaks out to the environment. And so, but what we have to be careful about is in having something that you can discard into the environment and will decompose, that we don't actually exacerbate that problem of carbon um, into the atmosphere immediately. Think about plastic to glass. And this is just the embedded carbon in its first manufacture. And then you've got to think about, you know, you, you're now moving your Coca-Cola or, or whatever it is that's in the bottle around what you're actually transporting now by weight really is the glass. And so you have, uh, you know, the life cycle assessment of glass as composed to, uh, compared to plastic is not a pretty picture at all. And so, you know, when I read that Coca-Cola has said that actually in the first half of this year they used 14% more glass than they did in the same time last year, as people have moved from plastic to glass, then you do worry. Because whilst we're actually seeking to actually get rid of the plastic problem, 
you're exacerbating what is actually much, much worse. So what is the solution? You know, if we're going to use this material, we have to recycle much, much more. And so I'm very pleased that McKinsey have put this diagram out, and so they've extended their diagram and projected that by 2030, probably more like 50% of plastic will be being collected for recycling. And so the mechanical recycling is still here, coming back in and actually being offsetting the actual polymer production. But what I would really want to talk about is this thing out here, which is pyrolysis um, and the pyrolysis oils. Because it's now possible to take plastic and actually turn it back into the oil from whence it came, and then put it back around the system and recreate virgin quality plastic from material that was plastic. And so you're simply going a, 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 a further loop and you're offsetting the use of fossil-derived um, oils um, and materials uh, for the production of virgin quality plastic. And so if you extend that to 2050, here's another way of looking at it, again from the same report from McKinsey, which is a, a very, very good report. And, and so they're saying, okay, look, you know, of the billion tons of plastic is expected to be used in 2050, and just pause there for a second, is that a good thing? 350 million tons last year, a billion tons by 2050. Um, you know, with a caveat, I would say, as somebody very concerned about the environment, yeah, that's probably a good thing. On the basis that an awful lot more of it is recycled, but it means I'm using less paper, I'm using less metal, I'm using less uh, glass, all of which have a much, much higher carbon footprint. And so what we have to say is, is can we grow the capacity to do that recycling that we're not creating a massive, massive problem for ourselves? And so there's an expectation here the mechanical recycling will be, you know, what is that? Maybe let's, let's call that 30% uh, or 25 to 30% of, of, of the demand. And then there's this piece in here, recovered monomers and recovered feedstocks, which is the sort of game that we want to talk about today. Uh, but of course then, you know, to actually grow this amount of material, they are suggesting that there will still be a lot of um, oil, a lot of gas being used to make plastics. Now, I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But let's just talk about this feedstock recycling. So when we were first uh, got involved in this, it seemed an obvious thing to me, but I'm only a mechanical engineer, and so, um, you know, to me, it was just like, well, you take a long polymer chain and you just chop it back up, and it looks like the oil that, uh, from whence it came, and from a mechanical kind of mind, that was just like, well, how hard can that be? And so, you, but of course, nothing's ever new, is it? And so the wonderful thing of Google, and you start to Google pyrolysis and thermal cracking and, and mixed plastic waste, and all of a sudden, you know, lots of evidence comes up about people that have done it before, and as is always the case. And one thing that really caught my attention was what BP Chemicals were doing at what was their site in those days up in Grangemouth. And in Grangemouth, they'd actually taken the mixed plastic waste, and they'd gone through the pyrolysis, and they'd made an oil, and, and that was fine. But they never scaled it up. And so I got in touch with uh, Grangemouth, now INEOS, and uh, I got to speak to some of the people that used to be on the project, bemused the 20 years after the project got canned, somebody was really interested in it. But what it transpired was, was that it seemed to work technically, but they couldn't make it work commercially. Because when you scaled it up and thought about all of the mixed plastic waste in Scotland, the problem was, was well, okay, that's gonna be quite an expensive facility. You're gonna go and build this refinery type structure, that costs a lot of money. So you go high capex. And then, of course, you've got to get all of this plastic from around Scotland, from the coast to coast, bring it all into Grangemouth. And then plastic didn't transport very well. And so, you know, that was going to be a high opex. And so high capex, high opex, and all of a sudden you don't have a business case. And then they say it's non-core business, and let's just move on. But of course, you know, from my perspective, you know, having spent a bit of time in the automotive industry and a lot of time in manufacturing and, and volume manufacturing, you know, my kind of bent take on that was, well, what happens if you shrink that whole refinery thing down and turn it into something that you can mass produce? Something like on the right-hand side in the concept, these are 20-foot isofreight type modules. You know, everybody knows how to move these things around. I thought, well, what if we shrunk this refinery down into these modules and then actually just took this type of plastic, you know, your films, your black plastic, your, your laminate type structures, your confectionery wrappers, your crisp packets, and you stuff it all into this chamber here, which is a fluidized bed running at about 500 degrees C in the absence of oxygen. And so because there's no oxygen, you can't burn. 
And so what actually, because there's a lot of energy there, you actually get this thermal cracking. And so from a mechanical mind, you know, my long molecules now get chopped back down into shorter molecules. Instead of being 2,000 carbon atoms long, they may now be some 20 carbon atoms long, that sort of, that sort of range. Now that takes a chunk of energy, and so you've got to get the energy in. And so we looked at all sorts of ways of doing that, but we settled on, actually, let's see how other people do it. And this is very similar to how oil used to get cracked when you take crude oil in and make petrol and diesel before people used catalysts. Now today, you'd call it a fluidized catalytic cracking unit for anybody that knows petroleum. And, and, and what you have is you have a regenerator in here, and you heat the sand, and you bring it in. And that brings your energy into this point to run the pyrolysis. And then the cool sand just comes back to the regenerator, and you heat it again. And so the plastic comes up in this line here and comes down into what's effectively a distillation column and, and then produces a range of materials. We'll come back to that in a second. But it doesn't all condense. Some of it is just gas, methane and ethane, you know, much of it you get in your natural gas. And so we bring that back in and use that as the energy source in the regenerator there to actually provide the energy for the process. And so um, of the plastic that comes in, 85% of the energy embedded in the plastic leaves in, in this material here, as, as the barrels of, of, of material going to the petrochem, 15% of the energy we cannibalize in the process to actually run the process itself. And so, okay, you've got an idea. You can take any old plastic, you can actually put it through a plant which you can mass produce and therefore get the capital cost down. Now you deploy it into the waste industry where the plastic already is. So if somebody comes to your house and they take away all of the material from your house, they take it to a material reclamation facility, a MRF, as the waste industry knows. And that's where we want to sell the machines to. Now, very quickly, because uh, time is rattling by very fast, actually, um, it goes faster in London. Um, and so, you know, you get a big distribution of, of uh, different carbon chain lengths from C5 here. You know, so you've got non-condensable gas in here, which we use to run the process. And then you have very light materials right there through to waxes. And we call this material plaques because, right, you know, it's slightly waxy. And so it was plastic, and now it's wax. And so we're only engineers, and so it's plaques, right? Um, and, and so we, we started looking at it as uses of fuel. We, we looked at it as marine heavy fuel oil, low sulfur. And for anybody that knows the marine industry, there's a massive um, uh, legislation coming in in 2020, which means that marine fuels have to go from the 3 to 5% sulfurs down to 0.5% sulfur. And so there's a huge shortage globally for low sulfur fuel, and so this is really valuable kind of materials. But what we want, really want to do is get from recovery and get up into recycling. If you take the plastic and you make fuel and then you burn the fuel, then it's energy from waste. And I don't want to be part of that. And so what we've actually found is by putting a crack in here, we could actually take this out as wax. And uh, I don't think Ian made it tonight. I thought he was going to try and make it to a guy from Kirex. And so he's bought all of this wax from as much as we can make, and he's in the wax business. But the rest of it, we're looking to take it back as a cracker feedstock so that it becomes more plastic. And so we're doing a lot of work at the moment to actually now tighten up that specification because actually that's where we want to go in the future. And so the way so this would look in the, in the waste industry then is that the material comes from your house, it goes into the waste system, you take out the plastics which are mechanically recyclable, this is your drinks bottles and your, your milk cartons, um, and that have a market. We like you to take away the PVC as well, because chlorine, uh, PVC is about 49% you know, uh, by mass is chlorine. And, and is chlorine has no place in oil, and so it's a pain. Um, does anybody know where the PVC comes from when you throw it away in your house? Because I was mystified by this. I thought, you know, PVC was like windows and gutters and downpipes. And this is like, you know, what, what do you mean you've got PVC coming through in the packaging? Because, by the way, it's illegal to use PVC in food packaging, right? You're not allowed to use it because it's, 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 it, uh, it's regarded as toxic. Um, but we all use PVC. We use cling film. <laughs> so, so you're not as a you, you, if you package food as a company, you're not allowed to use it. But every time you take it out of its original packaging and you put a little bit back in the fridge and you wrap it up in PVC, you're doing what the industry is not allowed to do because it's toxic. You can buy non-PVC oh, non cling film, by the way. It's branded as non-PVC cling film. 
It's polythene, um, and it works just as well. Um, anyway, moving rapidly on. And so what we wanted to do is sit in this position here as the bridge between the waste industry and the, and the, um, uh, the, the petrochemical industry. The petrochemical industry know how to clean up liquid oils. And so what we recognized was that we want to sell a machine into the waste industry to take a solid, i.e. the plastic, and turn it into a liquid. These guys, they only know how to deal with stuff which actually turns up to their facility in a ship, and they can pump the oil out. If it's in a ship and it's in vast quantities and they can pump it, then you just leave it to them. They know exactly what to do with it. And so what we had to do is go from solid to waste, uh, solid to liquid, waste to a product. They do not want to be tied up in the waste legislation. And so if you can actually take it from being a waste to show its end of waste, there's a legislative kind of step there, then these guys know exactly what to do. And so to do that, we have to take out water, we take out char, we take out heavy metals, or not all of them, because these guys are perfectly capable of doing it, but some of it comes out anyway. We take out a lot of the chlorine and the bromine from things like fire retardants and, and fluorine, if anybody uses PTFE, terrible stuff. Um, but we have to take those out through the process because otherwise they produce acids which are so strong that actually the back end of the plant doesn't last two minutes. And so from a self-preservation thing, you have to just take those materials out. Um, but really, fundamentally, what we're leaving is a refinery to actually do the cleanup because that's what they are for. Refineries refine. And so those exist, they've got the capacity, and we just got to get the material back to them and they can make virgin quality plastic which can come back around the loop. And so the way that that looks then in the system is it doesn't matter whether it comes from your house in a separated container and goes straight to a plastic recycling facility or whether it goes in, it's, it's still in the municipal solid waste and goes to a MRF. It all comes back into a plastic facility and it either comes out as this washed color sorted flake as mechanical recycling to go back to the compounder, to the molder, to the retailer or it comes out as oil and you aggregate it from a lot of different places. You put it on a ship back to the refinery and through. And so that's how the system will work. And so what we're doing is basically just providing the missing link, if you like, which allows that system to operate. And so just to give you an idea, a, a sense of the, the, the progress that we've made, if there's uh, any interest in that. So 2013, we, we opened up a, a facility where we'd been running it as a project at the university for a while. And, and you know, actually, you know, to be fair, universities quite often go quite slowly. And so there was a huge demand for what we were doing. So we gave up the day job and, and we went and built this tiny little thing here. And I look back and there was a wonderful naivety to it. But you know, that's the start of a lot of things, right? And so that became a little bit more complicated and a bit more sophisticated and we started getting the data points and started understanding how we were going to do the design of this and then we started scaling it up. And so here's our first regenerator and the sand comes down and comes into this. This is the pyrolysis vessel and, and uh, we put that together as a system in our shed and uh, we eventually got it to work which was a, a moment of great joy I have to say and, and great relief given that my house was on the line too. Um, and so we took it out to Swindenborough Council, who have been fantastic for us, and they've just given us a corner of a shed within a, a, um, a waste facility and allowed us to actually develop the process. So this superimposed thing here just shows the plaques as a, if you, if you don't fractionate it, just comes out as a soft wax. Um, and, and, and that was our initial kind of setup. And then we actually said, okay, well, we need to think about this mass production bit. Because this is where it's going to happen. This is where you get the economics, right? This is where you get something that can actually move the dial for the world. Because, and so we said, okay, let's use a 20-foot isofreight chassis. And so we had a go at doing that. And this is a distillation column leaving the manufacturing site, going into the council. And there you can kind of see them having been first put up. Um, the, 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 and, and so that's the plant, you know, pretty much as it exists today. Actually a little bit more advanced again, I guess. And so then we, that gave us enough confidence to move into this facility. And here we want to make 200 machines a year. And so 200 machines, if each machine does 7,000 tons, that adds 1.4 million tons of recycling capacity each year. And so when you bear in mind that the UK has 400,000 tons of capacity, across Europe there's about 5 million tons of recycling capacity. If you can start to add 1.4 million tons of capacity from a fiddly little plant in Swindon, then actually you can see how, actually if you add a few more of those plants in, you can suddenly start to add capacity at quite a rate. 
And so there's plenty of waste to go around. There's plenty of waste sites which actually want to have this kind of technology. And so therefore, um, there's no excuse for not building the capacity. And so just to complete the picture, as it looks on site, this is the, the plant itself. These are the product tanks. And uh, in the shed, you have a, a shredder and a dryer. Um, this first plant's going into Scotland. And uh, obviously, you have to have that in a shed because it never stops raining in Scotland. And if you're trying to dry stuff, you need to have it under a roof. Um, and, and it just zooms in a little bit. And so you can kind of see, so project number one, we've lost the theme a little bit because there's your 20-foot container. And there's the second one in here. And so there are eight of them. But then the regenerator has got a bit too big. Now, we've done this deliberately. Um, it's a technological jump. We're doing it at, uh, at zero. Uh, there's no back pressure on it. And so I talk about it in engine terms, coming back to my mechanical uh, um, bent. You know, so you, everybody knows you can turbocharge an engine, and you can get a lot more power out of a cylinder if you turbocharge the engine, if you compress the, the air. And so this is a normally aspirated version because that's what we've done on the beta plant, and we don't want to take that technological jump on number one. But in the fullness of time, what we'll do is whoop, um, we'll, we'll, we'll shrink this back into a container as well. And in doing that, you lose all of these containers at the bottom. And so number one is a little bit of a, a deviation from where we want to go, but you're beginning to see how it can look. But of course, these things only work if you get the economics right. I keep coming back to that point. And so um, at this stage, uh, to get the capex and the opex, and then the distribution back to the, or the aggregation back to the petrochem facility, to get that whole value chain to work, then you need what you call extended producer responsibility schemes. And so that is something that you know, you'll hear the government talking about. They, they talk about packaging recycling notes. You know, a year ago, packaging recycling notes gave people that recycle plastic 49 pounds a ton for doing that recycling. At the moment, because of the power of mass, um, the population and social media, those PRNs are now 450 pounds a ton. And so you can kind of see how the, the economics for doing this have suddenly really the tide has come in, and you could actually get enormous paybacks on a machine at this stage with EPR incentives. But you don't need those all of the way. And look, what we have to do, if you know what the Henderson's curve is, in mass production, the first one that you make is always a bit expensive. And by the time you're making 30 of them, and then 100 of them, and 600 of them, then the price comes down. And so in a very relatively short period of time, within three years, we think that whereas now we would say, look, you have to have a reason to pay for the material, you know, pay you to take that material. And at the moment, if you have to go to landfill, it costs you £84 a tonne in tax. If you go to an energy from waste plant, it costs you the same, interestingly enough, of course. Um, and, and so people are used to paying to get rid of this material, and they're very happy to pay to get rid of this material. And so you can start at a negative amount in terms of the uh, input materials. So you can get paid to process the material, um, and you can charge a premium for the recycled oil that comes from it. But you can't in Indonesia. And so our objective is to actually get this to a price point so that in Indonesia, we can actually afford to pay for the material, thereby incentivizing the collection. And everybody knows that, you know what, you put five pence on the price of a bag, and nobody wanted bags anymore, right? It's amazing that if it's, if it's for free, then you, you, you lose it. It doesn't have to be hardly any money at all, and it can completely change things. And if you go to Indonesia and say, actually, that material, which is actually getting dumped in the landfill, bring it to us, and we'll give you $50 a ton for it, you know you'll it won't go to the landfill anymore. It's not going to go to the rivers anymore. It's not going to be in the ocean anymore. And it'll very, very quickly want to come to recycling centers and we'll prepare to pay a little bit for it. You get the capex down, you got the opex, you got the cost to get it back to Exxon or back to Dow or back to BASF or anybody like that. And you can actually undercut the price of oil if oil was sat at $50 a barrel. And so you provide motivation for people to use this, and therefore the economics of this can actually work even when you don't have government incentives, so long as you get the cost of manufacturing down by making lots of them. And so you'll come back to McKinsey's diagram. Now, 
you know, I, I'm very good friends with the chaps at McKinsey that did this diagram, and I think it's been very, very helpful, but I do actually tell them as well it's wrong. Um, because actually, there's no real reason why this thing can't actually be much bigger by 2050 than that. If you've got a business model where there's no limit on the inputs, the economics are better than any other option, and there's no limits on uh, how much material you can sell, because that's all of this material, and if it's, this stuff is cheaper, then actually nobody's going to use this if this stuff is cheaper, right? And so when you've got no limits either side of a business model, and it makes money, and it's cheaper than the competition, then it should grow the capacity very quickly. And they said, no, the trouble is, is these beasts, energy from waste. That, that there is a competition for the material. Now, I ask you, does it make sense to actually burn plastic? Does it make sense to burn anything, quite frankly? You know, when carbon in the atmosphere is at 410 parts per million, anything that has carbon in it, if you can avoid burning it, please do so. Because it's a nuts thing to do. And, and it's destroying our ha the, the habitation or the habitability of our planet. And so anything that we don't need to burn, we shouldn't burn. And you say, well, we need the electricity. And it's like, well, yeah, but actually you can get electricity from wind, and you can get electricity from solar, and you can get electricity from hydro. And people say, well, it costs more. And they said, no, it doesn't anymore. And so, you know, if you look at photovoltaics, it used to there, but if you look at it from 2010 to 2017, the cost has come right down. And there are projects which are now disappearing below the, what's the fossil fuel price band. And so, you know, it was a real joy to me last year when I actually heard the GE won a contract in Abu Dhabi. And it wasn't a renewables contract, it was just a straight electricity capacity. And they won it on onshore wind against the cheapest country, or the oil country that has the cheapest oil on the planet. And I thought, what a fantastic moment that is. That's a tipping point. No longer do you actually build renewables because it's the right thing to do. You build renewables because it's the lowest cost thing to do. And so I think that this is, uh, there's, therefore, there is absolutely no logical reason to burn material and contribute to carbon in the atmosphere when the electricity you can get for lower cost from zero carbon sources. So therefore, if you're thinking about energy from waste, please uh, you know, uh, stop doing it. And stop anybody from doing it. I mean, the world's nuts. Anyway, so if energy from waste is not actually competing for the, the plastic and therefore taking, stripping stuff out of the system, then there's a lot more material that can actually be used for uh, recycling. And so my view is, is that that can actually grow by that level uh, uh, or, or, or by a substantially more than what McKinsey were considering. And of course, you know, the joy here is, is they've completely missed one of the wedges. You know, so we're working with a, an organization, and uh, a petrochemical organization, and they are the biggest diesel manufacturer, or biodiesel uh, producer in the world. And they're making biodiesel not from, straight from trees. They're making it from refuse. And so you think what goes into an energy from waste plant, 20% of it's probably plastic. 80% of it's bits of paper, and bits of food, and, and bits of cardboard, and it's biomaterial. And so they're taking that biomaterial and turning it into diesel. Now, I hate the fact that they're actually using that diesel then, and so you can see, if, you might have seen the adverts for BP, and they say, we poss possibilities everywhere. We see jet fuel coming from waste. So if you're around Heathrow, you'll, you'll kind of see that. And, so, and, and they can. And so people will take that biomaterial and they'll turn it into diesel or jet fuel. And if you can do that, of course, that's, the, that's also the same stuff, which is a precursor to making plastic. That can go straight back to a steam cracker, and you can actually make plastic. And so, it, uh, and, and, and the, the same company is actually working with Leiden Bazel to actually make the, the bio-derived plastic. So this is not biodegradable plastic, but this is just plastic that has come from biosources, and so therefore is actually decoupled from virgin uh, fossil sources. And so if you actually stick that in at a reasonable, uh, a sensible rate of scale, it becomes feasible that maybe by 2050, maybe it'll take another 10 years, but that the uh, inv inventory of plastic in the circular economy in the world is completely decoupled from the use of fossil materials. So the losses are made up by biomaterials, that the uh, augmentation of the inventory is made up from biomaterials. 
And so the wonder about that is, is that actually you've turned the inventory of plastic that is in the circular economy in the world into a carbon sink. And what a thought that becomes. And so now you have a material which is actually much, much lower carbon footprint in its actual production than, than glass or metal or paper. And it could become the most recyclable material on Earth by 2050 and could be coming a, be a carbon sink in and of itself. And so what a joy that actually a material which we today we regard as a scourge could yet actually become a very powerful tool in, in our future going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you.